Hey guys, and welcome back to a now for something a little bit different, episode 33. Guys, as usual, I'm always happy to see you guys. I hope everybody is doing well out there. Uh, episode 33 today, guys, I'm going to be talking about a graphic novel. Um, it is David Boswell, and I'm just grabbing it here, so bear with me for a second, guys. Ah, David Boswell's uh, Raid Fleming World's Toughest Milkman. Um, now, if you guys may notice, don't see my, unfortunately, my my good buddy, Mike, uh, and co-host, uh, Mike the Wildebeest, um, I have some news to share. Uh, awesome guy, and a guy that I have nothing but love for, uh, but unfortunately, he um, has had a new job opportunity um, that has arisen, and uh, because of that, it's going to kind of keep him a little on the busy side. So unfortunately, um, as much as it, it pains me to lose him, um, he's unfortunately going to be uh, no longer part of the show, which is a sad day for us here at now for something a little bit different. Um, Mike, like I said, is genuinely a, a good person and a great guy. Uh, and he brought something amazing to the show, um, his personality and his talent. So, Mike, you will be missed, and uh, I know our audience will miss you as well. Um, in the meantime, guys, I'm going to be doing some solo runs for a little bit, and I'm still going to have my eyes and ears out for anyone that's possibly interested in the idea of uh, joining me as a co-host. Um, like I said, um, I have some guest appearances uh, coming up soon, um, which I'll talk about at a later date, um, but there'll be going to be some fun stuff planned. And I'm still going to be putting stuff out, guys. It's just going to be a little bit different. Um, obviously, you guys saw me before Mike joined the, the show um, with the solo runs. Um, it is a bit more challenging. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's nice to have uh, a co-host to kind of break things up a little bit and also to bring some conversation to the piece that we're talking about. So for all those reasons and many, many more, um, it's going to be an adjustment, but hopefully you guys are here for the ride and hopefully we'll continue to bring you some great content that you love. Oh, so with all that said, guys, I guess I'll get right into it. Um, before I start my graphic novel review of David Boswell's Raid Fleming World's Toughest Milkman, I figured I would uh, talk about some stuff uh, that I've watched recently. There's not a ton of stuff. It's really just a couple of things. Um, so for the first time, I had a chance, and this was a, a rewatch um, of a movie that came out in 93. Um, it was direct-to-video. Um, most of you guys are probably familiar with Charles Band. He put out stuff in the 80s and 90s. Actually, he's still putting stuff out with his company, Full Moon. He put out a lot of genre stuff like horror, sci-fi. He put out some, like, some sex comedies and just regular comedies. If you like the low-budget fun the budget stuff, guys, it's great. Um, it's an alternative to, to, to Troma, which I, another company I also have nothing but love for. Um, so he produced a film in 93, and it's called Arcade. And Arcade is a science fiction film uh, about a bunch of teenagers. And, um, you know, they're a bunch kind of like these group of particular group of teenagers are kind of like the misfits. And, you know, every day they they either cut class or after school, they go down to the local arcade. Well, one day, our main character, uh, Megan Ward, um, who plays the role of Alex and Manic. Uh, quick uh, diversion here, because I should probably get into the cast before I go straight into the story, guys. Uh, I'm losing my, I'm losing touch here, guys. Um, so Megan Ward's our main character. She plays Alex Manning. Um, most of you guys might know her from Encino Man back in 92. Um, she was big in uh, Joe's Apartment back in 96, which is a cheesy, silly musical comedy involving roaches. But uh, I love it, man. It's a really fun movie. It's also MTV's uh, first feature film that they produced, I'm um, and um, So she's known for that. And then another one that I really love is um, PCU, which came out in 94. Um, she had a really strong role in that. Uh, and she was also in a, another indie comedy that probably doesn't get enough love. Uh, and at some point I'm going to probably talk about, which is called um, Glory Days, which actually has uh, her, an up and coming Sam Rockwell, very young, uh, has Ben Affleck, uh, French Stewart. It's another like slacker type comedy. Doesn't get enough love. It should. It's a fun movie. Uh, down the road, I definitely want to do that as a review. So um, 
So she plays, uh, like I said, Alex Manning. Um, we have Peter Billingsley who plays Nick. Now, and you guys might know that name um, mainly from, hold on a second, guys, I'm cheating here. I'm looking down at my cheat sheet and it's very obvious. He was actually in Iron Man, the first Iron Man movie. But more importantly, you guys probably know him from uh, A Christmas Story. Um, he was uh, the lead character as a kid, as a child actor. Um, since then, he's gone on to doing a lot of producing. And, you know, he's done some acting roles here and there. He pops up in little small parts. Um, but he played the secondary lead in uh, this particular film. So it's it's definitely worth your time and one that I highly recommend checking out. So um, another character that appears is in a very minor role uh, is Seth Green, also in an early role. Um, like I said, this movie came out in 93. He plays a character called Stilts. Now, you guys all know Seth Green. He's been in Can't Hardly Wait, Austin Powers. Um, he was in another great movie that I liked in the 90s that doesn't get enough love called Airborne, uh, which is also really fantastic. Um, so those are, I mean, there's more people involved in the cast, but I'm not going to get involved in everyone. Uh, I figured I would focus on the names that you guys probably know and some of the central characters. Um, it has a script by David Goyer. Now, you guys uh, probably know David Goyer, Dark Knight. Uh, he wrote the script, believe it or not, for Dark City, Alex Proyas's uh, follow-up to The Crow, um, which is an excellent film that didn't perform well at the box office, um, but should be given a second chance. I'm surprised it hasn't been given a 4K release. It's a really good film. Um, we also have uh, an Albert Pun, uh, I'm probably pronouncing your name Albert wrong, so I'm very sorry. Um, he's our director, and you probably know him, guys, from stuff like Captain America, not the new one, but uh, back in 1990, uh, which is a really kind of cheesy, eh, okay film. I'll, I'll be generous. But, you know, if you're a comic book nerd back in 1990, you didn't have a lot of comic book films being on the big screen. You had batman in 89 and oh man i can't think of anything up and all the way up until probably the next batman in 92 and then you know the one with val kilmer and george clooney uh superhero films were scarce so even a cheesy one uh that was directed video beggars can't be choosers guys so um so yeah he had done that uh he had directed um a movie in 84 called radioactive dreams which is kind of like a cult movie it's got like some cult status to it um, he did Cyborg in 89 with uh, Van Damme, which is also another cult movie. He's one of those guys that, for the most part, he, you know, he knew his lane and his lane was, for the most part, cult movies, you know. Um, and he was good at that. So no, nothing but love for him. Uh, so anyway, I got a little derailed there. As you guys know, I tend to get derailed. Sometimes I go off on tangents or get derailed. Back to the actual story. So, yeah, the, our main character is Megan Ward. And like I said, Megan Ward. Um, plays Alex Manning. Um, her, her and her boyfriend, uh, A.J. Langer. I, can't, I forgot to write his name down, the character name, guys. I'm slacking here. But anyway, them along with their friends go to this arcade. They cut class. So they go to this car arcade every day. And on one day, there's a man there, and he's a mysterious character. Ooh. Uh, and he uh, introduces everyone to a virtual reality machine. Now, this is way back in the early 90s, guys, when virtual reality was just something that was kind of talked about, not really the thing that it is like nowadays with the Oculus Rift and, and other technology. So essentially, uh, he lets uh, people play the game for free once. And um, Alex Manning's boyfriend gets into the machine and he is immersed in this virtual reality world. And the next thing you know, he's sucked in. And he's stuck in the machine. So, uh, Alex Manning and our character, Nick Billingsley, uh, Peter Billingsley character's Nick, um, they realize that he's missing. And they're a little concerned, but they figure maybe he went home or they'll find him. So, while that's happening, um, the guy that's demoing this virtual reality machine in the arcade offers everybody a home version of this machine he's like oh yeah you guys can try it out here you go here's the, here's your home console of this virtual reality machine and uh they all go home and almost everybody uh with the exception of nick and alex manning um start playing this home version and they get sucked into the machine um 
So it, it's a B, like I said, it's a B flick, guys, but it's a fun B flick. Um, essentially, what ends up happening is uh, Alex and Nick try to figure out what happened. Uh, they realize after stopping at one of their friend's house that their friend um, has been sucked into the machine and it's kind of like in this zombie state. So they know there's something going on and it's definitely connected um, to the actual machine. Uh, so they eventually end up at the, the game design company and they talk to the engine, one of the engineers they have a conversation with. And he basically kind of gives them like eh, essentially a cheat code um and they he said the only way you're going to ever see your friends again is to actually play the game you have to play the game beat the game and then that'll release all the players uh that the game has taken so basically like essentially we got like a possessed video game essentially they never really tell us if it's like a deal with the devil kind of thing or i'm gonna just chalk it up to a possessed arcade game that's taken over these teens and suck them into this virtual reality world so alex and nick um go home they gear up on their their home system here. They enter the virtual reality world. And pretty early on, unfortunately, Nick also loses and gets stuck in this world. Um, they essential, She essentially, with the help of the cheat code that she was given by this engineer, is able to defeat um, the ultimate bad guy uh, um, and um, release her friends. Uh, Everybody is all right. And we think hey, everything's wonderful. And then what happens is essentially um, we find out that this demon from this arcade game also managed to escape. And that's like the big end reveal. I guess they were leaving themselves open to the idea of uh, a possible um, sequel, if you will, I guess. So, yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, like I said, Full Moon, like Troma and a lot of these... Uh, uh, direct to video type companies you got to just be in the mood for that kind of entertainment and i was i was in the mood for something low budget um that had a fun idea a fun concept uh had some actors that i that i liked um like i said i'll watch anything with megan gordon same thing with seth green and like i said you know i honestly i'm, I'm not gonna lie guys i thought um peter billingsley um i honestly thought that he had disappeared off the map i didn't realize he was still doing work so it was just a delight just to see him on the big screen again um, so definitely check out Arcade. Um, you can find that on Tubi. Um, and like I said, it's well worth your time, guys. It's definitely fun if, if you don't mind like sci-fi horror with a nice tinge of be, be goodness to it, you know? Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, next thing is uh, Christine. Came out in 83. And believe it or not, it's one of those movies I'm a little bit embarrassed as a horror nerd to say I never got around to. Um, another thing I never knew, again, this is on me, guys. I don't know why. I didn't realize uh, John Carpenter directed this. I mean, John, John Carpenter, you got to love John Carpenter, you know, um, whether he's making a AAA top tier movie or even his like movies that aren't quite as good are still highly entertaining. Um, this is an example of that, guys. This movie is not John Carpenter's best film, but by no means is it a bad film. Um, and it's still better than most of the work I see by a lot of um, modern directors. So um, that says something about the guy's work. Um, this was written by a guy named Bill Phillips, who I didn't write down everything he did at all, guys. He pretty much has a predominantly TV career. Um, I'll just say that. Nothing wrong with that. And, of course, the original story by our man Stephen King. Um, and the tagline is a nerdy kid buys a cool old car that's possessed and it goes around killing people. Uh, it's a 58 Plymouth Four. Excuse me. 58 Plymouth Fury. Um, we have Keith Gordon, who's playing uh, the character that um, gets possessed by this machine. Um, it kind of has this like almost like this, this. The machine almost has like this stalkery relationship with him. And he basically flips out on anyone that gets in the way of his relationship with this Plymouth Fury. Um, and basically, I mean, the best way to do it is like, I guess describe it like almost demon car possessed slash almost like Jaws. Um, it has that kind of theme. I know Jaws is kind of like a weird analogy, but the way the car goes around killing people, you know, just kind of like the way Jaws does in all the Jaws movies. This car, even when our main character Arnie isn't in the car, uh, 
it's going around on its own and killing people, getting vengeance on people that wronged it. Um, so we have Keith Gordon uh, as our lead playing Arnie. Um, most of you guys probably know him as um, an actor in Back to School, uh, like a Jaws 2, so talking about Jaws, um, Dress to Kill, and all that jazz. What a lot of people don't know is this guy is one hell of a talented director. He's actually one of my favorite independent film directors. And uh, that's a big claim for me, guys, because uh, I like a lot of people, and I'm kind of particular. Um, he did a movie called A Midnight Clear, which is an anti-war movie, um, which is excellent. He directed. He did a Kurt Vonnegut novel. That I'm still waiting for a Blu-ray release, which hopefully one day it will get, uh, called Mother Night. Um, you can find it on DVD. I don't think it's streaming anywhere, sadly. Uh, he did the excellent film, uh, Waking the Dead with Jennifer Connelly and my boy, Billy Crudup. Uh, you got to plug Billy over there. Uh, fantastic movie. And then he's done a ton of TV stuff like Dexter, Nurse Jackie. I think he's done some Waking the Dead, um, Walking The Walking Dead, excuse me, and stuff along that lines. Um and like I said, this is just like a pretty basic premise. You know, guy gets, finds this old beat up Plymouth Fury. Uh, he fixes it up. The car kind of possesses him. He has this love-hate relationship with the car where he's kind of possessed by the car. And the car goes on a killing spree. Um, and uh, it's it's a fun flick. It's a fun little supernatural film. So that's what I'm going to say about that. Now, just a second here, guys, because I have to flip to my Ray Fleming notes here, which is in a different notebook under my little Kindle scribe here. So just bear with me here. Um, so with that said, we'll get into Ray Fleming, World's Toughest Milkman. Um, the volume I showed you uh, is by the company, publishing company, IDW. Uh, and that came out in 2010. And that collects the first, oh my gosh, I'm sorry here. As you see, my, uh, for some reason, my uh, tripod is moving around a little more than I'd like. So sorry about that. I do apologize. Um, yeah, Ray Fleming, the comic book graphic novel I just showed you, that one was uh, basically, uh, they republished it back in 2010 and they collected it into one graphic novel. Um, but it's written by a guy named David Boswell. Um, and he's a comic book writer and artist. Uh, he's also an illustrator and a photographer. Um, he stems from uh, Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, and he's best known for the comic book rated Fleming. Uh, Boswell grew up in London, Ontario, um, where he started off studying film, of all things, at Sheridan College, um, and he graduated in 1974. So this is an, a comic book that goes way back in the day, guys. Um, Boswell was first published as a cartoonist in 1977 and given his chance at his first full comic book. Um, it was actually printed in a newspaper called the Georgia Strait, and it was a comic called Heartbreak Comic Books, or Heartbreak, the Heartbreak Comic. Excuse me, guys, I got that wrong here. Um, this is where Ray Fleming first uh, made his first appearance, uh, and this is quoting Boswell. Uh, Ray Fleming lurked in my sketchbook for a my sketchbook for nine months before seeing the light of day. Um, though initially intended to be a one-shot replacement weekly strip in Heartbreak Comics, uh, the public had other ideas, and Ray's nonstop quest for fun took over. Um, so yeah, it, it, the Ray Fleming character was just this fun, stupid character that. He made up on the fly and, you know, originally just going to be this little thing. And then next thing you know, that was the thing people gravitated towards. That's the people, that's what people wanted to see more of. So in 1978, uh, Raid was given his own title. Um, Boswell was also heavily influenced by film directors like Joseph von Stromberg and Louis Bunnell and by comedians uh, Buster Keaton and W.C. Fields. Um I'll just hang tight for one second. Um, in 1980, uh, the first comic book, uh, he actually self-published. And this comic book um, collected the previous appearances from 1978 and 1977. 
Um, and that was published by Boswell. Um, and then in 1986, Eclipse Comics began publishing a regular series uh, appearing annually for five issues. Um, they did that, and they also, again, reprinted his earlier work. Um, sadly, in 1994, Eclipse went bankrupt, um, which sucks. This guy went back and forth with different companies, um, like I said, also self-publishing, trying to keep this thing going. Um, so Eclipse went, uh, I can make words to the guys, I promise. Eclipse went bankrupt in 94, uh, it took a couple of years, but then in 96, um, Canadian publisher Deep Sea Books, Deep Sea Comics reprinted all the previous issues, uh, as well as three new issues. Um, so that was pretty cool. That was some exciting news for him. Um, I'm going to just go back for one second. Um, Boswell based uh, the Reed Fleming character off a childhood buddy. Childhood buddy. Childhood bully, yes. I'm really uh, struggling here today, guys. You can see it's been a while since I've done this solo. Um, yeah, so he based off a childhood bully he had when he was a kid, um, who surprisingly enough had the same name. Now, what's shocking about that to me is that he was able to get away with that without getting sued. Usually most people change the names just to protect themselves. So I was kind of surprised by that. Um, so yeah, so he did uh, the Eclipse comics in 94, like I said, they went bankrupt, sadly. This Deep Sea Comics uh, took over, reprinted the older stuff, and then also uh, reprinted a couple free new issues. And then finally, in 2010, IDW Comics um, made two volumes of Reed Fleming uh, graphic novels, collecting all of his work. Um, the first volume is the one I showed you right there. Um, and apparently there's a second volume out there somewhere. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a little bit of a back history. Um, again, guys, I'm, I'm a little fumbly today between the stupid tripod and, uh, it's the first time me doing it solo in a while. Um, and it's definitely a little bit of a struggle. I'm not going to lie, guys. Um, I'm glad to be putting something out for you guys, but I do apologize, uh, for some mishaps and mistakes I'm going to be making, um, Next, I figured, guys, I'd get into some of the actual characters. Um, there's, I'm really going to be focusing mainly on the first issue today, so I'm not going to get into the whole world of Ray Fleming. I'm going to establish the main four characters that are relevant um, to the story we're going to be talking about in another minute. Our main character, of course, is Ray Fleming, who is essentially an anti-hero, and he's basically a crude, rude, alcoholic milkman who has destroyed multiple milk trucks. Uh, imagine, if you will... Uh, balding, dirty Harry, but with better one-liners. And honestly, I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's what the character's like. I mean, he has lines like, I thought I told you to shut up, or 78 cents, or, or I'll piss on your flowers, lady. You know, like, stuff like that. It's just so ridiculous, but it's also very effective, and it really is, like, almost a parody of, like, these hard-as-nail, hard-boiled cop-type characters. But instead of a hard-boiled cop, he's playing a milkman. So... It's very silly, very fun, um, really great dialogue, and really ridiculous and over the top. Um, another line, want to make something of it, you know, like all these like crazy, you know, again, crazy, like it's basically playing on the hard as nails cops kind of character. So that's Ray Fleming, uh, the character, essentially in a nutshell. Um, next we have, and I'm cheating, guys. You can see me looking down. I'm trying not to do that, guys. Mr. Arch or his Mr. Crab, who is his his basically his arch nemesis, shall we say? Um, Mr. Crab is the supervisor of the milkman, and um, he just basically has a vendetta against um, Ray Fleming. Uh, he's also hard as nails, um, and he hates Red. He, he hates Reed, and. Um, He's basically, I mean, the best way to explain this guy is he's kind of like one of these enforcer type characters that you see in like these B action movies. He's somewhere like a cross between like an Arnold Schwarzenegger character and almost like if you guys have ever seen the movie uh, Point Break and you know the character actor John McKinley, he's that, 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 that drill sergeant or that sergeant that's always coming down on our main characters and he's always giving them shit like one more time McLean and that's it, you're done. You know, he's like one of those type characters. Um, and again, it's done in a way that's over the top, 
and so ridiculous that you're along for the ride and it's effective. Um, it's really funny um, and it's highly recommended, um, which I'm going to give my final thoughts. So I'm going to wrap them up hopefully a little bit more neatly once I once I'm all done here. Um, our final, we have two more characters I'm going to briefly touch on. Um, one is the actual boss. Um, Crab was the super, his supervisor, uh, Mr. O'Clock. He's the president of the milk company um, that Ray works for him, um, Milk Incorporated. And he's a well-intentioned, um, but unfortunately naive character. Um, he's the kind of guy that always wants to give people the benefit of the doubt. He doesn't want to come cracking down on Raid or, excuse me, Reed or anyone. He wants to hear what they have to say before he, you know, drops judgment on them or before he get, tries to get them in trouble. He's essentially a nice guy at the end of the day. Uh, like I said, he's just a little bit naive because Reed is doing a lot of things that he shouldn't be. Um, so that's Mr. O'Clock. And then finally, we have a character named Cooper. And Cooper is uh, Reed's, Reed's best friend. Uh, he's worked for the milk company for over 19 years, and he's also their laziest employee and is often found asleep at the job. Um, so, like I said, these are the main characters. Um, there are a lot more other characters in this story, in this world of Ray Fleming World's Toughest Milkman. Um, but for all intents and purposes, for the first issue, which was what I'm going to be discussing today, guys, I figure I'll just focus on our main core characters. Um, so... The title of the first issue uh, is A Day Like Any Other. And in this, we're introduced to our main character. And as we're introduced to our main character, guys, he's pounding on someone that had just made fun of Milkman. So he's got this guy full throttle choking him on the ground, just giving him the beating of the lifetime. And as he's done, he threatens the man life. He threatens the man life, driving away in his milk truck, swinging a bottle of gin. And this is all in the morning time, guys. Um, as he makes his first official stop of the day, um, he is introduced to his customer, not introduced, but he, he has a conversation with his first customer, a lady who looks like a stodgy old cranky lady. And she's talking about how noisy is it, how noisy Reed is. And Reed's response is, listen, lady, if you don't like it, tough. Give me 78 cents or I'll piss on your flowers essentially you know he's like i said he's an anti-hero he's he's a bit of an asshole she like got in his face so he got back in her face he doesn't care if he loses his job he's one of those type guys um so of course there's repercussions for this guys because we live in a world where there's repercussions for your actions even in the comic book um this leads to her calling in to complaint um to his job and this is where us as readers were first introduced to Mr. O'Clock, our naive boss, and we're introduced to Mr. Crab, our diehard supervisor with a vendetta um, to basically get Reed at any cost. He wants them fired. He wants them out of there. Um, they hear this phone call and Crab's, Mr. Crab's is enraged. He's like, this guy, enough of him. Every time you let this guy go, you let him off and let him off the hook. Enough of this guy. We're done with him. You know, I'm going to go get it myself. And Mr. Clock trying to calm him down and say, oh, there's probably just a misunderstanding. But Mr. Krabs doesn't want to hear it. He's out the door. And as he's walking out the door, enraged, we're introduced to Cooper. Because Cooper, Reed's best friend, is sitting on a bench and he's fast asleep. So, of course, Mr. Crab yells at him and tells him to get his ass to work. Um, so, while that's happening, we go back to Reed. And Reed um, is on his route, and there's two young punks in a car, and they pull up to him, and they call him a skinhead for some reason. Now, Reed Fleming is a portly guy in his mid-30s, guys. He's partially balding. Um, he's got, like I said, a real arrogant, tough guy, crude attitude. Um, he doesn't take shit from anybody. They call him a skinhead, and they challenge him to a drag race. Now, most people in this situation, guys, would be like, hey, fuck these guys. They're just being idiots. No, not Reed. What Reed does is not only does he agree to the drag race, but he gets out of his milk truck. His milk truck. He chases them down on foot. He climbs onto the back of their car and proceeds to drop a lit matchstick in the gas tank. 
the car blows up and parts of the car go flying everywhere, including everyone in the car and Reed. And coincidentally enough, Reed Fleming at this particular time and moment happens to land directly on who other than Mr. Crab, who's driving by in a convertible. Um, he lands in Mr. Crab's convertible in the passenger seat next to Mr. Crab. Mr. Crab crashes into Reed's milk truck. And then they both get out of the car. And Mr. Crab proceeds to scream at Reed and threaten him and basically say, listen, we've had enough of your shit one more time and you're done. That's it. We've had it. So he's doing this, screaming at Reed. And while this happens, in the background, we see a tire from that exploding car fall to the ground and hit Mr. Crab right in the head, knocking him unconscious. So like I said, this, this whole thing is absurd, guys. We know this is absurd. It's ridiculous. But it's also a fun ride. So this happens. And of course, because Reed is a crafty fox, he's like, hmm, how can I use this to my advantage? So what does he do? He gets a bottle of gin from his milk truck. He puts it in Mr. Crab's hands. And he takes a picture. And from there, we see him going back to the milk company. He has a conversation with Mr. Clock. Mr. Clock's, you know, about to lay into him and start lecturing him for the complaint that he received. And he's asking him where Mr. Mr. Crab is and why he isn't with him. And um, Ray's like, you know, it's funny that you mentioned Mr. Crab because there's something I think you should be aware of. I'm, I'm a little concerned for him. And he pulls out this picture. And of course, it's a picture of Mr. Crab appearing to be unconscious on the asphalt with a bottle of gin in his hand. And of course, Mr. O'Clock says, oh, we can't have this. We can't have drinking on the job. I'm gonna, there's gonna be consequences for this. I'm gonna have to take action. So we see Raid Fleming and our boy Cooper, who was introduced briefly, and they're inside Raid's house, drinking and watching TV. And then we cut to Mr. Crab on the streets in a milkman uniform delivering milk. And that's essentially how we end our first issue of Raid Fleming, World's Toughest Milkman. So, guys, um, yeah, that's that's just a little tease. Like I said, uh, again, guys, I could go into a lot more detail, but it's like a 212 pages. It's collecting six issues. Um, this reprint right here of Raid Fleming, World's Toughest Milkman, has a lot of cool extra stuff, including some interviews. Uh, it has an introduction by director, film director Jonathan Dem. Um, it's definitely worth seeking out. And like I said, guys, I know I'm a little rusty today, and I know I've already said that I'm overkilling saying that, but it's been a while. Um, I will not lie. I was very spoiled with Mike. Mike handled the uh, the uh, the summary on when we talked about films and stuff like that. And uh, I will not lie. He's uh, very, very good at it, and uh, I give him mad props for that. I'm a good writer, I like to think. Um, but when it comes to summarizing things, it's just never been something that I've been overly good at, um, something I need to work on and get a lot better at. And uh, that was always his specialty, um, which is kind of why when he was here, I was glad that he did that. Um, but that's OK. We're going to keep moving forward and I'm going to keep on bringing some good content for you. And hopefully, like I said, guys, we'll we'll get um some people involved. Um, we have some a couple of good, great guests lined up, like I said, and I'm also, like I said, hoping to um, possibly get a, another co-host. You know, um, it's just a matter of finding someone that's also interested in uh, talking about film uh, and finding someone that's going to be a good fit. Um, and you know, it, it sometimes it's it's challenging because just people just have so many things with our lives, guys. You know, um, between let's face it, between our jobs, families trying to minute, find a minute for yourself just to breathe, you know, it's tough to, to just find that time. And I think that's, that's half the challenge. Um, even for me, when I was doing this solo before Mike got involved, it, it's, it's time management and finding enough time of the day um, to do it right. You know, when I mean, do it right. Like I love that you guys are watching these videos, even when you've seen some of my ones, some of my videos that weren't perfect, you know, and this is an example of that, you know, you guys had my back, you had my support and you were there for the ride, but it's so hard 
even when you're not getting a perfect video, it's there's so much work that goes into it, you know? Um, and that's why I think it's hard to find a co-host, you know, um, because it, it can be challenging just finding um, someone that can commit the time to it, you know? Um, but like I said, we got nothing but love for Mike. He's awesome. And uh, I wish him nothing but great things in his future. Um, he's been a supporter um, from day one when I started back in August of last year. Um, and he'll be missed. Um, so with all that said, guys, um, I have to kind of refigure things. Um, like I said, the next couple episodes, I am going to probably do solo. Um, I just have to, have to kind of wrap my head around which episode, which film episode I'm going to do next. Um, and like I said, within two to three weeks, um, you'll definitely have, um, I'm going to do, like I said, you'll get another episode, another film episode probably by the end of the week from me. And then within two to three weeks, you'll, you're going to have two special episodes where I have special guests lined up. So that's just stuff to look forward to guys. Um, so I hope you guys are enjoying the content and you're along for the ride. Um, I do want to give a quick shout out to all my boys. Um, that would be of course, Brad and Troy over at uh, not a bomb. Uh, not a bomb is an excellent podcast. Um, they've been a huge supporter of me since day one. And they're awesome. And basically, they cover any film that was either a commercial or a critical failure. And uh, they discuss whether it really was uh, deserving of the title failure, you know, because, you know, a lot of times just because a movie doesn't perform well at the box office doesn't mean that it's a failure. Um, so those guys are awesome, you know, and if, like I said, a huge supporter. Um, of course, The Gentleman's Guide to Midnight Cinema, uh, Will and Sam. Or as we like to call them the godfathers of podcasters. Um, if it wasn't for them, I think so many of us podcasters wouldn't be doing our own little solo thing or or uh, co-hosting with someone else. Um, they cover such a wide variety of different material, everything from Main Street stuff to uh, cult stuff to horror to sci-fi. They just cover the whole gamut, and they're, they're just really, really amazing. Um, of course, watch Skip Plus with Jose and Alex. Jose, of course, is an awesome guy. And um, we had him on for the episode we covered when we covered Ken Russell's The Devils. And he's a true gentleman and just a wonderful human being um, with such a knowledge of film. Um, so great podcast. And him and Alex have such fantastic chemistry. So check that out um, wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, Recently, I started listening to, within the last couple of months, I started listening to Raiders of the Podcast. And uh, these guys, these guys, I don't know how they do it. They cover like three to four films every episode. Um, and they're fantastic. I mean, they did an episode last week where they covered four Gerard Butler films. Four. Guys, I struggle with covering one film or the occasional uh, comic book episode. I don't know how they do it, but my hats go off to them. Um mad props for being able to pull that off so these guys are great definitely check them out um so uh yeah guys that's the show for today um like i said game plan is to definitely have a film out by the end of the week and then if i can do another episode next week i'm gonna try um i don't want to make promises that i can't deliver um because because i have on the 19th i have two separate episodes scheduled um with special guests it's two episodes that i'm doing the coverage for and i'm going to be covering doing the coverage by myself essentially like doing all the research and all that stuff and um they're really fun episodes i have um jose joining me for uh condor man which i love the stupid film it came out and i want to say 82 83 i don't have my notes on that with me right here and it's a direct-to-video disney film uh about a cartoonist writer that gets involved in this like spy conspiracy thing really fun i have that um with jose and then i also have later on in the day on the 19th i have uh my crying freeman episode um which i have troy and brad along for the ride and um like myself troy in particular i know is a huge fan of action films and we're both nerds when it comes to um crying freeman um, and that was a comic book um, that I grew up with. It was actually my first introduction to manga. Um, and it's a fun action film. And it's a really, really cool movie. So it's 
going to be hopefully a really fun discussion. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so yeah, those are the two things that are like my major focus. Um, but I look forward to seeing you guys and I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. And, and again, I apologize for my stumbling with my words and a couple mistakes. Like I said, it's been a while since I've done this solo. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys soon, hopefully um, by the end of the week. So I hope you guys, like I said, have yourself a great week.